Today's story is brought to you by Manscaped. Use code WESTSIDE at manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping. The West Side Fairy Tales is a dark fiction and horror podcast. The story you are about to hear is violent and disturbing. Exercise discretion before listening. Previously on Scars in Time. Ash's first night in gun cotton is eternally blemished by a parade of horrifying visions, culminating in the death of a man who commits suicide right in front of her eyes. Though the town itself seems welcoming, it's obvious there's something going on just beneath the surface. Now Ash must come to grips with the death of a stranger on top of dealing with her increasingly severe delusions. And they haven't even moved in yet. Now, without further ado, Chapter 5 of Scars in Time. The Mayor. It's safe to say I didn't sleep much that night. I walked back inside after the man leapt from the balcony and I sat at the foot of our bed, watching the steady flickers of blue and red light grow on the hillsides around the hotel. Eventually, Darcy stirred, and I think my sitting at the end of the bed like that must have scared her, because I could feel the entire mattress shift a second later. She made a small, scared noise like a hamster. Jesus, Ash, she said. What are you doing? I think I saw a man kill himself, I said. I'm not sure. She sat up and fought off the covers to wrap her arms around me. I felt the brush of her eyelashes against my neck. Men's voices moved softly, urgently through the closed glass of the patio doors. I touched her wrist. Was it a dream? She asked. Do you see those lights outside? I asked her, pointing. I couldn't see her squinting past me, but I felt her cheek move next to mine. It was slightly fuzzy and very warm, almost hot, from the pillow. I pushed against her, closing my eyes. Police? She asked herself more than me. I nodded, keeping my eyes closed. There was a chill sort of peace settling down over my heart. An ancient, lost sort of feeling that hadn't visited me for nearly thirty years. The same thing I'd felt the last time I saw someone disappear silently over the edge of a cliff. Darcy went to the patio doors and walked outside, grabbing her coat along the way. She was wearing the costume of every midnight spectacle chaser. A heavy coat and night clothes. She rubbed her arms and looked over the railing, covering her mouth and then glancing back at me. There are police, she said, returning her gaze to the brilliant lights. Darcy sat back down beside me and grabbed my hands. What did you see, babe? Are you okay? I shook my head and she hugged me, crushed me, really. I... I... Walked outside for some fresh air and he was hanging off the railing, I said. We talked for a second and then he... He... I started crying and Darcy squeezed me hard enough I thought she might suffocate me. Then she stood up and began pacing. Fuck, she said. Oh, God damn it. What? I asked, worried myself. She saw and shook her hand side to side. Not you, babe, Darcy said. I... 
I just realized I'm the only fucking doctor in like 40 miles, and I don't think there are any paramedics here. You should go down there, I said, finishing her thought for her. The words sounded like a mantra, not a real idea. No, she said. Yes, but fuck. No, you... Her eyes were worried. She touched the steel frame of the patio door. She had neglected to shut it, now little fingers of cold were creeping up my ankles. I pulled my legs up underneath me, curling up at the edge of our bed and watching my wife work through her dilemma. You really should go if you can help, I said. She heard me in that way she did when she was deep in her own thoughts. Not really at all. Finally, she paused and looked at me, taking a deep breath. Would you mind if I left you for a little? She asked. Consider it an act of triage, I replied, smiling. Her eyes hardened in a way I didn't like, but knew it was my fault. You just saw a man. If you saw what you said, she started. Ash, I know you can be a touch fragile sometimes. I, I don't know if it's okay to leave you alone. But you have to, I said. There was something cutting to the words, a knife that sliced at my tongue when I spoke them. You have to, Dars. I nodded, and she smiled. It was sad, that smile. But a second later, she was flat-eyed and moving with purpose throwing on her clothes and digging through our bags for the little medical kit she brought on every long trip. It was a heavy, red thing made of canvas that I'd bought her as a sort of gag gift when she'd graduated medical school, but she'd commended me on finding such a complete kit. It always made me kind of happy when I saw it. Then she kissed me and left, giving me a small, distracted wave before shutting the door. I looked at the lights now flickering through our entire room, not just the red and blue I associated with police, but also the hard-edged discs of spot and searchlights. They moved and paused and stuck in place for a while. When I went to the patio door again, the valley was full of artificial light. I shut the curtains and lay down on the bed. The new lights outside made the room feel darker. Not the deep, blinding black of true darkness, but the horrifying, synthetic dark of a childhood bedroom. Everything was blue and brown shadows, pulsing and growing with subtle changes in the light. I saw things, figures like people made of stacked wooden discs. They sat and stood throughout the room, occasionally shifting with a sound like a small log being pulled from the center of a stack of firewood. There was no keeping an eye on them. They lived only in the corner of my vision, fading the instant I looked at them. But I knew they were there, knew with a depth of knowing that I never associated with my normal visions. They were really there, and they were utterly harmless. That I knew as well. They were simple things, like dragonflies or dandelions, just part of the scenery though they surrounded me in a way that I didn't appreciate. I felt almost on trial. But perhaps they weren't looking at me as they gathered around my bed, but at the gentle and silky arms moving down from the ceiling, the graceful, fluid things coiling over my chest and stomach and thighs, over my mouth, pulling me down into some warmer place beneath my mattress, not stealing my breath, but keeping it from my mouth as I sank into the electric wasteland of my dreams. Is this podcast so good you almost want to skin it and wear its bloody hide in the streets as a testament to your undying love? Then go to our merch store today at westsidefairytales.com slash merch and buy yourself a t-shirt. All proceeds go to support the show and our episode artist, Yui Breedlove, gets a percentage of every sale. So, if you like the West Side Fairy Tales and want to support us and the amazingly talented woman who makes the art, head on over to westsidefairytales.com slash merch and purchase a mug, a hat, a sweatshirt, or a t-shirt. 
head over to westsidefairytales.com slash merch today. Thank you, and, as always, stay safe out there. Now, back to our program already in progress. I woke with a start. The morning sun flooding into the room along with the rasp of curtain rings on their brass rod. I blinked and found Darcy's silhouette by the glass, moving toward me like a blob. She touched my face and kissed my forehead. Hey, babe, she said, sitting on the side of the bed. I could tell from her eyes that she was exhausted. I need you to get up, okay? What time is it? I asked. She checked her phone. Almost eleven, she replied. Are we going to miss checkout? Darcy chuckled and shook her head. No. The hotel knows we're going to be staying at least one extra day, given what's happened. The sheriff's department already cleared it with them. Sheriff's department? I asked. She nodded again, closing her eyes and looking at the patio. She sighed. That's actually why I need you to get up, she said. There's... Jesus, I don't even know where to start. She rolled over top me onto her own side of the bed and lay down, curling her right arm around my face and bumping the sides of our heads together affectionately. The man you saw, his name was Jacob Morgan. She started. I could see her searching for words in the patterns of plaster on the ceiling. He died, unfortunately. There wasn't much we could do, and it took far, far too long to find him. And aside from the young woman who worked at the checkout yesterday, you were the only person to speak with him face to face since he left his home some two months ago. He's been living here for two months? I asked. The robotic quality of Darcy's voice unnerved me. I wondered if that was how she sounded when she worked in the hospital. She shook her head and stretched her arms toward the ceiling. No, she said. He got here about an hour before we did yesterday, which is when the young woman downstairs met him. The last person to talk to him before that was his landlord. In Detroit. Detroit fucking Michigan. What the fuck? I asked, looking at her. Where was he? Why, why come here? To kill himself? I added in my head. That's not the crazy part, Darcy said. She stood up and stretched more, as though laying in bed with me for all of ten seconds was the same as a full night's rest. I know his name, knew his name, long, long before we got here. He's... She shook her head and looked at me. Ash, he's a fucking real estate agent. He's the one that brokered the sale of our new house. The sheriff's department detective said his name was Lee, repeated his rank, and thanked me for my time. If not for that introduction, you'd never expected the man worked for anything other than a bank. Maybe some Wall Street firm. He wore a plain, bluish-black suit with an overly patterned tie that reminded me of an ugly couch. Darcy worried the interview would upset me further, but I honestly didn't mind. It was an interview, firstly, not an interrogation. I'd gone through an interrogation before, after I'd murdered somebody, understandably enough. An interview was no different, no less uncomfortable or invasive, in fact, than a conversation with a psychiatrist. Polite, probing. I think what throws most people off is how impersonal the whole thing can be. But impersonal was fine. It meant I didn't have to impress anybody and that let me emotionally off the hook in full. Did you know Mr. Morgan? He asked. We were in the lobby of the hotel, which was now bereft of its lobby attendant and swaddled in police line tape. The only safe access to the back of the cliff was through the office or people's rooms, apparently. 
so the little thoroughfare was now marred by dozens of boot prints. Not at all, I said. My wife did. I searched his eyes at the word wife, but saw nothing untoward. It might be a fair conversation after all. But only from the phone, I think. I never even heard her mention him. Never? He asked. He sat across from me, one leg over the other and his phone resting on the table between us as a recording device. I glanced down at the little numbers flittering higher and higher. Not that I can remember, I said. You both bought a house together in another state, and you never once heard the name of the man selling you the place? He asked. The question was pointed, but his tone was neutral. I shook my head. Do you mind answering out loud? There's no video. No, I said. I cracked my neck and added, Darcy handles that stuff for us. I'm not, well, great with that sort of thing. Contracts, details. But you're a writer, he said. Isn't that a detail-oriented profession? If you're any good, I replied, shrugging. I haven't published anything notable in years. He chuckled and I smiled at him. Maybe that had sounded like a joke, maybe even it was, but it hadn't felt like it when I'd said it. What were you doing out on the porch last night? He asked, changing the subject. Getting some air, I said. And Mr. Morgan was outside? Yes. Doing what? I swallowed. Hanging. Hanging from the railing. I said. Like this. I put both my arms out in front of me and then turned to the side, leaning back over the arm of my chair. He nodded and continued. So he was hanging from outside the railing? Over the cliff. Yes, sir. I said biting my lip over the extra propriety. By both hands? Yes. And what was he wearing? A suit, I think. I shrugged. Dark-colored shoes. He looked fully dressed, I guess. Detective Lee nodded. And how did he look? How did he look? I asked, cocking my head to the side. That is, what was his demeanor? Did he look manic, drunk, uh, anything like that? Detective Lee clarified. I looked at the floor for a second and then shook my head. I guess you could say he looked, seemed kind of manic, yes, but more like happy, I think. It's hard to say. Maybe almost relieved, I guess. Relieved, Lee asked. I sighed and nodded. What gave you that impression? The, uh, the look on his face and, I suppose, how he talked to me. I replied. Lee asked what Morgan said to me. Just, he just, he asked me how I was doing. Or, no, actually what he said was, lovely night, huh? Or, or something like that. Did you say anything back to him? Lee asked. I sighed. Maybe something like, sure, or yeah, I guess. I, I can't really remember. It was... I slapped my legs hard enough to make Lee jump a bit, but I wasn't paying any attention to him. The pattern on his tie had started to swirl, like a dirty river running past a rock in the stream. It was just such an odd, horrible thing. I... I, I can't believe it happened. I can't believe I was there. I started crying and then Darcy's hand was on my shoulder. I felt her press a handkerchief into my hand. Lee waited patiently for his moment to continue. I grabbed Darcy's hand and cleared my eyes. I didn't know why the event had bothered me so much. Or rather, I did, but just didn't want to admit it to myself right then. 
Mr. Morgan's passing had simply reminded me of much worse events in my life. Things that should have remained dead and cold and nearly forgotten. But weren't. Did he say anything else? Detective Lee interjected, leaning forward slightly. I sniffed and caught my breath, leaning back in the chair. He said like, whoops, time to go, or, or something like that, I said. Detective Lee waited a second longer for me to continue. Then he went, I finished, holding up my fists and opening the fingers. Whoops, time to go, Lee repeated. How did he say that? Did he say it to you? He looked down at the floor and then quite intently at me. It was the most animated he'd been since we'd started talking. It's a phrase you'd say if you just made a mistake or noticed something, right? Well, did he notice anything? Did you say or do something? My wife would never say or do anything that would make a man jump off a ledge, officer, Darcy said. She was mad at him, but it was my shoulder her nails dug into. I patted her down before she continued, tapping her fingers with mine. Yes, actually, I said. I mean, no, I didn't say or do anything, but he did sort of, well, look inside at something before falling. Inside his room, the detective asked. I nodded. Yeah, like, I don't know, like the way you might check your watch or a clock or something, I said. Then he was just, he was just gone. The detective nodded and grabbed his phone, ending the steady scroll of numbers with a push. Then he stood and shook both our hands, welcoming us to West Virginia and taking down some extra information in case he had to get a hold of us. I told him I didn't have a phone, which gave him a second of pause, before Darcy added that he could just call her to get in touch with either of us. Detective Lee said a bright, low voice from the doorway. Both Darcy and I looked in that direction, but I noticed Lee jump a bit. The man we found was wearing a dull red suit and a patch over his left eye. I could see the thing like Lee wasn't ornamental either. Three nasty lines of scar tissue crept out over the flesh around it. The detective cleared his throat and turned with his hand already out. Uh, Mr. Chatterley. He looked like he would have saluted if it were possible to do so without looking ridiculous. Mr. Chatterley took his hand, shook it, and slapped him on the shoulder. How are we today? Chatterley asked. Good, sir. Very good. Detective Lee said. You on your way back to Tardrady? Chatterley asked, not letting go of the hand. I recognized the name of the nearby town. Like many places out in the hills... It was famous for bad reasons. No, sir, Detective Lee said. He finally got his hand back. I'm on my way to Beckley to, well, handle all the necessaries with the medical examiner. Good, good, Chatterley said. Is your mother well? Detective Lee smiled like a child. He nodded and wrung his hands together. Better every day, sir. He said, Thank you, sir. I'm glad to help, Chatterley said. Carbonus County needs men like you, detective, and women like your mother. You give her my best next time you see her. I can't well make it up to Targrady often, as you know. Yes, sir, I'll do that, Detective Lee said. Then he exchanged a few more pleasantries with all of us and left. Mr. Chatterley turned to watch him go and then shook both our hands, introducing himself as Bobby. And Bobby's how I'd like to be called, if you don't mind, he said, smiling. The skin around the eye patch didn't move with the smile. Much in the same way, his tone never quite matched his words. Not wholly different, just slightly off. And there was a sense of effort when he spoke almost as though people were a difficulty to him that he'd learned to handle with great aplomb. 
I described his voice as being both low and bright before, and that may have come across as odd to you. The effect to me was that of a very, very hot piece of iron glowing white in a dark room. Not quite illuminating the place, just the barest shapes of hands and faces and furniture. But there, in a very powerful way that demanded notice. Before he even told me the town belonged to him, I could have guessed it. I'm sorry this is how you spent your first day, he said, talking mostly to my wife. I really, really hope you won't be reconsidering your appointment here. She smiled at him and put her hand over his. Not at all, she said. They broke their handshake and he gave her a broad smile. If at all possible, I would like to get you to the temporary clinic today just to see how things work, he said. Knowing that's going to be too much to ask anybody... How about I offer you breakfast instead? On the town, of course. I... Darcy started. She looked at me, and I nodded. I... Er, we would love to get something to eat, she said. Perhaps there was something that should have prevented us from accepting. A retreat to our rooms for psychology's sake, I suppose. But honestly, I was starving and wanted more than anything to be away from the sight of the man's death. I knew at some point my own internal morbidity would take over and I'd be begging Darcy to relive her experiences with the body. If I didn't, then my own mind would take over and fill in all the gaps with the worst possibilities. So it was always better to know, to face the little demons. That, if anything, was the one strength I had in life. I could be selfish, cowardly even. But even when I was afraid, nothing would stop me from taking the next step. So I went to breakfast with my wife and this odd man who would, before lunch, be threatening my life in the dark hallways of my own new home. Hey there, Westsiders. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Some of us men got some issues going on downstairs. (laughs) That is to say, just because it's beard season above the belt doesn't mean it should be beard season below the belt. Luckily, our friends at Manscaped got you covered with their new Lawnmower 3.0 ball trimmer. You can tame that Wookiee you've got hanging out in your pants and improve the overall look and feel of your sack game. It's got a waterproof design you can use in the shower and LED light so you can really see what you're working with. And a 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology so you can keep your new do a surprise before the uh, big reveal. Manscaped has a ton of other great products that you guys can check out at manscaped.com. And if you use code WESTSIDE, W-E-S-T-S-I-D-E, at checkout, you'll get 20% off and free shipping. So again, show this episode's sponsor some love and make a purchase at manscaped.com and use code Westside at checkout for 20% off and free shipping. Manscaped, make your testies their besties. Now, back to our story already in progress. Breakfast was lovely, though. We took a short walk through the hillside neighborhood on a street named Laurel, which began right across from the hotel. To our right was, essentially, the top of the hill and the end of the town itself at the base of the mountain. I could see a children's play area past the cul-de-sac where Wall Street, the tall street that led up from the strip to the top of the hill on the town's right side, ended. And that's where the house I grew up in used to be, Bobby said, pointing to a flat patch of parkland a ways up from the intersection of Laurel and Walsh. It was fairly irredeemable, so we bulldozed it after a time. But we have been able to save quite a few of the town's older homes. He looked around and then smiled at us. We were walking behind him. You can't save everything in these hills, but what you can, you ought to, most of the time. Where do you live now? 
Darcy asked. He smiled and pointed to the grey leaves of Old Town. Even from up here, you could barely see through the dense canopy. Only the barest tops of some of the huge homes were visible from up here. I could even see the black windows of my own future garret, though I didn't yet know it. But beyond all those, at the edge of the grey trees, was a house unlike anything I've ever seen. Not even a mansion, but a full-on manor. Wide-bodied, it spread out across the front of the mountain behind it like a sort of massive gate. The brown and cream-white stone shone in the sun. Wow, Darcy said. People actually live in that place? She heard herself sounding rude, but Bobby waved a forgiving hand the second she noticed. It's more of a massive dormitory than a real house, though that is what it used to be, he said. His low, bright voice became less low, more bright. A very wealthy man named Compson, who founded this town, built that place and the small clutch of homes down there. The other houses have, traditionally, always been the residences of the town's foremost professionals. Pharmacists, lawyers. He turned without missing a step to gesture to Darcy. Doctors. You said it's a dormitory? I asked. Bobby nodded. More accurately, an orphanage, he said. We take in kids from all across the country. He paused, considering something, and then continued. I had something of a bad childhood myself. That ended, but, well, it sucked, and I don't want other kids to have to go through it too. He cracked his fingers. We don't, can't. Take in everybody we want to, but we make a comfortable home for those we can. We arrived at the end of Laurel Street, fittingly called Elevator Station Road. I watched as the massive cables pulled one of the odd, angular cars into the station. Bobby led us behind the main platform, where a simple concrete path curved alongside the mountain wall to let people pass the cars without having to get on the tracks. Tiny electric lamps there ran even in the daytime to beat back the shadows between the mountain and the rear of the platform. The street opened up on the other side of the platform and so, it seems, did the entire world. There were only a handful of houses on this small side street which didn't seem to accommodate vehicle traffic at all and most of them hung right at the side of the cliff. Even without being in them, I knew the view was incredible possibly even better than at the hotel. That made me think of the man, Mr. Morgan, but I quickly pushed the thought from my mind. We ate at an old house refitted to be a tidy little coffee shop slash restaurant on a rear patio sporting just the view I'd imagined. Bobby told us the place had belonged to an old friend of his who'd passed away a long time ago. He'd purchased the property after her death and when the current owners expressed interest in starting a kitchenette and gun cotton, he'd sold it. Now, he said, he got to visit whenever he wanted, and they paid him the property taxes. The city, really, he said with a laugh. But I am the city, so there's that. And how did that happen, Mr. Chatterley? I asked. Bobby, please, he said. He scratched the area under his eye patch. The long version is, well, long, and very personal. Suffice it to say, I grew up here and some bad things happened. Then some good things happened during all that, and ownership of most of what you can see fell to me. He waved his hand out at the little slice of gun cotton nestled in the hills. If it sounds too good to be true, it is, sort of, he continued. More like... It's too true to be good. Ownership of the land came with all sorts of extra responsibility. I can't ever leave, in fact. He laughed, but only a bit. And the land's basically worthless. So was the town, at least when I took over. But I had some seed money and a bit of pull thanks to some powerful folks I knew, and next thing you know, I've got West Virginia's Silicon Valley 
growing out there like a little fruit bush, I, I don't know. He grinned at us. Basically, if you're worth a shit to the town, you don't pay much in taxes, he said. Also, there's like no restrictions on what I let people do down there, so, you know, if you're weird anywhere else, you can come here and not be weird because everybody is. People appreciate that and, well, here we are. Unprecedented growth. He said that last bit with little air quotes. He sighed. Still, there's a long way to go. He said. Kind of make this place comfortable and self-sufficient for when everything goes tits up. He shrugged. Darcy and I exchanged a look. Goes, uh, what do you mean by that? Darcy asked. He looked at us and actually blushed. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh man, sorry. Sometimes I forget who I'm supposed to be, he said. I felt oddly at home with that statement. I mean, West Virginia as a state is run by fucking morons and they're always trying to shit on everything. Eventually they or somebody is going to fuck everything up and I want gun cotton to not get caught in the fire. And I wanted to thrive after. He gave me a very direct look for some reason. I smiled and turned my attention back to my egg sandwich. It was delicious but big. I raised my hand and asked for a box when I saw the waitress. Oh, shit. There's one other thing I've been meaning to tell you. Bobby said. He fumbled around inside his suit and pulled out a key so corroded it was black. A throng of hemp with a leather tag hung from the hole at the top of the key. He set it in the center of the table. That's for you guys. A key? I asked. The key, he said. To your house. How'd you get that? Darcy said. Her politeness wavered a bit and she snatched it off the table. He chuckled. Well, because you bought it for me, of course, he said. We both gave him a look that actually made him laugh. He held up his hands. <laughs> I told you, I took control of almost everything in Gun Cotton, including four of the old manor homes in Old Town. Darcy looked at the key and then back at him. Yeah, but why do you have the key? She asked, very directly. His good mood never wavered. I could tell, if Darcy couldn't, that not only had this guy expected this encounter, he was actually enjoying it. Because Morgan hadn't gotten it from me yet, he said. In fact, I'd always planned on giving it to you both in person. Kind of an uh, official welcome to Gun Cotton from the mayor himself. He held up his hands by his face and shook them, adding in a low voice, Welcome. Thanks, I guess, Darcy said, tucking the key away. I had no idea why, but I wanted to snatch it away from her right then, just before it went into her pocket. I wanted the ugly, pitted metal in my hand. My eyes must have lingered a little too long because Bobby was staring at me intently when I turned back to the table. Something on your mind, he said, that low brightness almost cutting in his tone. I cleared my throat, feeling a flush of sweat breaking out on my neck. I shook my head, trying to clear it for some reason. No, I said. Just, it's been a very, very long day. And I don't know, shouldn't we tell Detective Lee you have that key? If it comes up during his investigation... You have the key now, Bobby said, leaning back and scratching his hairline. In the distance behind him, I could see the faint outlines of a massive, leafless tree sitting on the high plains of the mountain rising over Old Town. Besides, I don't know what Lee's investigation would turn up, other than that Morgan killed himself for some reason. We could let him know about the key, but I don't know how you're going to get into the house without it if he has to confiscate it as evidence. He shrugged. 
None of that will be necessary, Darcy said, kicking me gently under the table. I cleared my throat and drummed my fingers near the edge of my plate. Thanks, honestly. I don't know what we'd do if you hadn't held on to this for us. Think nothing of it, he said. But if you need to stay at the Gun Cotton for a couple more days, I'll have the town shell out for it. We need a full-time doctor here badly, and that's more than worth the cost. He smiled at Darcy and then turned his attention to me. The expression was almost unreadable. I found my gaze lingering on the fabric of his eye patch. And if the circumstances surrounding your new home are, well, too unmanageable, we could put you up there until one of the smaller homes in town comes on the market, he said. It shouldn't be too long. No, I said, flatly. Darcy looked at me again, but Bobby just smiled. A soft, small smile. I cleared my throat. I, I mean, that's not, that's not necessary, I meant to say. He nodded. No problem, he said. None at all. He dropped a handful of bills on the table and stood stretching and adjusting his suit. He wasn't remarkably tall, I noticed, though I'd thought him to be much larger all the time we were talking. All in my imagination, I supposed. Now, let me walk you ladies by your new house, if you'd like, he said. I'm not sure what else you might want to do today, but I can have one of my kids run over the necessary papers, and you can be done with me for the foreseeable future. He smiled. Darcy stood as well, smoothing out her shirt and stretching. I could tell she was dog-tired. Oh, that's not necessary, she said. You don't have to walk all the way down there on our account. He shook his head. Like I said, I live down there. We're really just sharing company on the walk, and actually, we don't have to do much walking anyhow. Hello, my name is Tyler Bell and I am the host of the West Side Fairy Tales. For better or worse, this operation is basically a one-man show. I do all the writing, reading, editing, music, and the various other production aspects. Yui Breedlove does all the wonderful episode art you see online. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider compensating us for the experience. Anything, even just a dollar lets us know that you believe the West Side Fairy Tales is content you appreciate. You can donate to our efforts directly through the PayPal link on our website, westsidefairytales.com, or by pledging to support us on Patreon. For just a dollar there, you'll get access to these episodes without ads like this, and for five dollars or more, you get access to members-only content, including fully produced eBooks of the episodes and behind-the-story lore episodes. And, at ten dollars or more, We'll start sending you special merch packs and a whole lot of other stuff. The West Side Fairy Tales is a one-of-a-kind production, and we can't thank you enough for just taking the chance to give us a listen. But odd, off-the-wall, incredibly unique productions like this are self-funded, and without the generous support of listeners like you, we wouldn't be able to stay on the air. So, please consider keeping great horror independent and supporting the West Side Fairy Tales today. Thank you, and, as always, stay safe out there. Now, back to our program already in progress. What he meant was that we'd ride on the Incline Railroad down to Old Town. It was a proposition I was far more excited for than I let on, given the oddity of the steep railway with its crooked cars. These are usually on independent tracks, he explained as we rode in the thing, sitting in facing seats. But when old man Compson built this for his workers a million goddamn years ago, there was already a street here, so they just laid down trolley tracks. He smiled, 
looking down at the cabin floor and tapping his shoes. The tracks just keep the thing on a single path and ensure a smooth ride. He continued. What really moves this thing is a cable mechanism up at the top of the lift. The cars are also connected by a cable that goes up around a pulley, turning them into each other's counterweights. That way the whole apparatus only needs enough power to move people. He grinned. Ours runs on solar and wind batteries. Solar and wind, huh? Darcy asked, looking around. From where? My other side of Big Blue here, he said, tossing a thumb at the mountain behind us. Gun cotton is kind of shit for reliable wind and light, and honestly, space. So we set up a few farms in the next five or so valleys. So long as we can afford the mechanics to work on the turbines and the panels, the power itself is free. He tapped his fingers on his legs, clearly pleased with himself. Actually, a lot of the battery stations are set up in the old mines under our feet, he continued. That's where we run the cables, too, so as not to mar all this wonderful countryside. He chuckled. I actually couldn't give two bits about that, but running through old tunnels was much, much cheaper than trying to go over the mountains. I would have never even thought of that either. It was one of my kids' ideas. We arrived at the bottom of the platform, a few of the locals getting on with us en route. Bobby rolled his eyes when he saw them jogging across the tracks to hop on the descending car. They're not supposed to do that, he said. This car is for all the way up and all the way down only, but people are impatient. Still, when they passed him, he raised a hand and smiled. I noticed they all returned the gesture the same way, palm up by their right shoulders, fingers splayed all the way out. Something thin whispered just behind my ear when I saw that, but just then Bobby looked at me. Did you hear something? He asked. Darcy shook her head. I said nothing, just swallowed and looked out the window. At that moment, the canopy of Old Town was swinging up past the tracks, and I could see a little black box floating atop the highest leaves. Then it was gone. We got off the train and stretched and started walking for Old Town. I noticed that Bobby stopped while crossing the bridge and tapped his shoe twice in the middle of it. When I saw him doing that, he smiled and winked at me. Gotta make sure it'll hold, he said. Then we were at our front door. It was odd how I was thinking of it as just that, as our front door, even though we hadn't so much as set foot in the place yet. Bobby waited at the foot of the stairs as Darcy took out the key smiling at me and even giggling a little before putting it in the lock. It slid home with a series of satisfying clicks, but nothing happened. Huh, she said, turning to us. I think it's stuck. Why don't you let Ash try? Bobby asked. It struck me as odd, him using my more casual, shortened name. I always introduced myself as Ashley to official-type people like him. I didn't like them using my favorite version of my name. Still, I appreciated his suggestion that I try. Darcy shrugged and stepped away from the door, leaving the key in place. It turned smoothly between my fingers. There was nothing special about the moment, just a key working the way a key does. It could be said that the action of the incredibly ancient lock was really, really smooth despite how old it was, but I hardly noticed. My hand was shaking when I turned the knob and pushed open the door. Then I was inside. The entry hall was two stories tall, rising straight up to a chandelier hanging from a heavy chain in the ceiling. I reached and turned on the lights without thinking not quite realizing right then how easily I had found the switch. It wasn't even a normal switch, but two buttons which pushed each other out depending on the on-off state. I didn't care about that, of course. My eyes were wandering, fluttering, flying about the larger spaces around me. I could see the house quite suddenly in a series of images and after-images, 
with superimpositions and audiovisual palimpsests, a brain cluttering flood of information. First, a girl dancing to a simple rhythm in her head. She jumps and lands with her arms completely out to her sides and her knees at 90 degree angles. Then she stands and spins, thinning her body out with her fingers pointed above her and her toes like little needles beneath her. Then, two women are screaming at each other in one of the side rooms while a man slowly loads an ancient powder pistol. His face is long and gray, though he is still quite young. Gun loaded, he watches the candle cast shadows of the arguing women bouncing over the floor beside him. He aims the gun at one shadow and then the next, going back and forth while humming a little tune to himself. Finally, he settles on one of them, closes his eyes, and lets his head roll back until it faces the ceiling. Next, a girl sits alone against the wood-paneled walls beside the stairs. Her clothes are not as nice as those the others have worn. A great patch of her hair is missing, and there are fresh sutures in the skin there binding together great, nasty rivers of torn flesh. Her eyes seem dead, though she, so far, is not. Finally, a man, a very tall man, though not so tall as to be unbelievable, paces the floor with a pocket watch dangling from his fingers. His other hand works a cane to keep his balance. His eyes flit to every dark corner of the room, which is lit only by the fire burning away in the great hearth at the heart of the home. There is a sudden belch of ash into the space, and the man turns to see some twitching, branching thing protruding from the flame-like tentacles flailing about the mouth of a squid. He falls to his knees, crawling forward into the baptismal filth. Unexpectedly, Bobby is standing in front of me, but he is no longer Bobby. The house is no longer the house either, but rather a loose collection of house-like parts. I can see walls and floors bounding about us through true, inky darkness. The illumination on them is like a trick. It comes from nowhere. Then, he is not Bobby. He is something else. His face is flat and angular, and his teeth are like a hundred little needles that don't quite fit into his mouth. His remaining eye is blood red, and I can see something ethereal and green burning behind the eye patch over the right socket. He grabs my throat and talks, his tongue slithering out some language that moves on oily psychic trails rather than on air or paper. Then I am in my new home again. The bobby thing holds me against the wall, and though the house is dark, I can see perfectly fine. This is my town. He says, My home. I know. I say, This house is your house now. He says, But if your poison leaks out into my town, I will cut you like a fish and feed what's left to the dark. His hand is rougher, tighter than a hangman's rope. I can feel it cutting through my skin. But when I look for help, toward the door, I can see myself standing and looking around the house. The normal Bobby is standing by my wife, by Darcy, pointing at this and that and smiling. When she looks away, however, his eyes are dark and direct and all but boring into mine. Ash. Ash. Ash, Darcy said, touching my shoulder and snapping me out of a daydream. My mouth was so dry I couldn't help but cough. Sorry, I said, fighting to clear my throat. I I just sort of dazed off. It's fine, she said. Mr. Chatterley said he's going to get going. Want to say goodbye? I almost told her I didn't, but he was suddenly right there. Like I said, you can just call me Bobby, he said, holding his hand out to Darcy. I hope you both enjoy your new home, and that you, well, feel at home here in Gun Cotton. It really is a great place, and... 
If you need anything, don't hesitate to call. He took my hand and looked into my eyes with an off-putting directness. I'm always around. He smiled at both of us and then excused himself. Darcy shut the door behind him and then wrapped her arms around me, kissing me deeply. I didn't expect to sigh, but I did, returning the kiss as hard as I could. I love you, she said, eventually. I told her I loved her too, hoping I didn't sound distracted. Though she was in my arms, my eyes could do nothing but watch that red glimmer moving away out the window, cutting through the gray of our new neighborhood like a torch in a rainstorm. Next time on Scars in Time. Ash and Darcy take the day to explore their new house, a place as full of secrets and lost memories as it is bad wiring and rusted pipe. Ash's visions continue to haunt her, and, though they now all have a very specific setting, this odd house in Old Town Guncotton, Ash finds she's no longer quite feeling herself when she has them. I hope you'll join us next episode for Scars in Time, Chapter 6, The House. And until then, as always, stay safe out there. The West Side Fairy Tales is written, read, scored, and produced by Tyler Bell. Original audio filmed on location in Sutton, West Virginia, and Louisville, Kentucky. Engineering and sound design by WSF Productions, LLC. Episode art by Yui Breedlove. All content herein copyright 2020, WSF Productions, LLC.